already surmised that perhaps we might be talking about uh, DRBD in here today. Uh, hi, I'm Auntie Taylor. I work for Sun Microsystems. I hack on Drizzle, which is a fork of MySQL, if you haven't heard about that already. Uh, but that's not what this talk is going to be about, even though I have liberally sprinkled the Drizzle logo inside of the talk. Um, uh, but hopefully, uh, almost everything that I'll say in here is should be database agnostic and actually is applicable to things that aren't uh, traditional databases as well, um, if you're into that sort of thing. Um, I'm just going to jump straight into it. Um, mainly because I couldn't find the about me slide in an open document presentation to copy in. So I'm sorry. You don't get a nice picture of me sitting at Burning Man. Um, so uh, Heartbeat and DRBD is a, um, DRBD is the main thing. I almost always combine it together when I talk about it as Heartbeat and DRBD because there are, there are other forms of, of cluster management that you can use, but it winds up most of the time for me that Heartbeat is, does enough and also doesn't do too much. Um, but anyway, that's a longer story. So um, what DRBD is, is it's, it's distributed storage. It's, it's sort of like a network RAID 1. Um, uh, or it's something like uh, shared nothing, shared storage, uh, if that makes any sense whatsoever. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, but the network RAID 1 part uh, of, of hard drives over, uh, over two machines is probably the, the best uh, metaphor for it. Um, it's, a, it's a synchronous replication. You have, a, you have a one machine that can take writes, one machine that cannot take writes, but they're both in sync at all times, and a write on the one machine does not return the F-sync until the F-sync is done on the other machine. Um, so you're, you're pretty much always, always in sync there, that being what the words synchronous replication mean, um, rather than me just giving you a really, really long, rambling definition of synchronous replication. Um, it's, it's, I, I particularly like it because it doesn't require special networking components or uh, special hardware. Uh, it's all, all commodity hardware based. Uh, there's nothing, nothing fancy or expensive that you have to buy, although I'm sure that some of the salespeople at Sun would prefer that I um, talked more about things that did require fancy boxes, but okay, whatever. Um, I, I think that it has excellent performance. It sort of depends on, on how you quantify that, and we'll talk about what that exactly means. Um, uh, when you're when you're doing this, um, uh, I'm pretty sure there's a slide that mentions that later on. Um, but the other thing that I like about it is that it it, it handles some of the inconsistencies and and things like uh, fencing, auto fencing, and, and preventing preventing split brains in a pretty decent way. Um, and and that ties right in next with that next little bullet point, which is the hides the complexity of many of our reactions. Once something's gone wrong and, and you're recovering, it's actually a lot of times it can just auto recover itself. Um, and and I, I really like that because in other situations where you're setting up like a, a, a active active pair or an active passive pair or something like that, um, it's all well and good and it does the failover and you're like woohoo we failed over. Um, now we have to deal with this machine that failed and um, th that requires you know me going in like completely rebuilding it from scratch or something like that, which it may have to if like a, a meteor had hit it and you've got to replace it. But you know it's not every day that meteors hit your your boxes unless you live in a very weird place. Um, in which case, I can't help you. Um, we use Heartbeat to manage the, manage the whole system. Uh, DRBD itself doesn't actually self-manage a whole lot other than the transmission of data back and forth. Um, and, uh, and, and, a, and a main thing to, to point out here, this is originally sort of in the scope of, of MySQL itself, but, but it, it's, uh, it's for any other system you're going to put on there, it, it really supports transactional storage engines and, and more importantly, things that are, uh, are, are, are atomically correct to, to disk. Um, because uh, a failure event is going to look on the on the recovering machine uh, like a post disk failure event, essentially. Um, so as long as you're writing to disk in such a way that you can sanely recover from power cycling a machine, um, then then you're not you don't have to worry about data loss. If your if your file system or your application or whatever is writing data to the disk in such a way that um, you might lose data after a power cycle, then you might lose data after a, a recovery here. Um, so that's just sort of a, a thing to keep in mind. There are other systems that, um, th that are more specific to other things that you can do. Um, uh, so th there's sort of a checklist over there. Uh, this, this is the, the, the most important thing that's in, in red over there to the side is that there is there's no built-in load balancing here. This is, this is, this is purely an active-passive uh, high availability system. Um, this does not in and of itself provide you any additional capacity, and in fact, in some cases, it, it lowers some of your, your write throughput ability. 
um, uh, and, and it, does, it does not allow you to magically use seven machines and pretend that they are one machine. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's just a, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty cheap and easy way to get a, uh, a high avail highly available setup. Um, yes? Uh, both, depending on what you're doing. If you're putting a database on this, no matter which one it is, um, you, can, you can read and write from, from the one machine that's active and the other machine, uh, you really can't touch it because uh, it, the block device is gonna be changing out from underneath it and unless your database is really, really smart, uh, it's gonna get really, really confused really quickly. <laughs> um, if you're doing non-database related things, like you, you've, you've got a file system on top of this or, or something, something else that's like that, you can, uh, you can run it in an active, active, uh, active mode. You can't write to both of them, but you can, you can have it so that you can mount the file system on the passive machine and read those files out of it. Um, but you've really got to be running a file system on, on the machines that understand that the block device might be changing out from underneath them, like GFS or OCFS2 or something like that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, so that so that 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 metaphor is is a flawed metaphor. Um, <laughs> Um, it's it's like the it's like the highly available portions of of, of raid one without the uh, anyway yeah so yes. So there's a uh, no um, in the short answer. Uh, there's a thing um, that used to be a, a purchased add-on that you could buy from Lindbit, which is the this is written by a company called Linbit, which is out of Austria. Um, they, they had a purchased add-on called DRBD Plus, uh, which I believe has just been uh, uh, open sourced and rolled into the, to the regular product, um, which allows you to have uh, like a, a, third, a third node attached, and I believe there's some things in there for, uh, for mitigating sort of WAN situation problems. But for the most part, it's, it's uh, if, if, your, if your link is, is sort of shoddy, it could, it could be sort of annoying for you um, because it, it is, it is, uh, it is in, pretty intentionally uh, synchronous rather than asynchronous. Um, that being said, you could fake that by downing the secondary node for periods of time um, because if the secondary node goes away, the primary node just stops trying to write to the secondary node and the secondary node will pick up the changed blocks once it reconnects, but that would sort of be a really, really weird, sort of weird sort of setup. So I. Yes, yes, in fact. <laughs> so, um, so normally when when we when we when we roll this out with sorry before being a developer on the Drizzle project for Sun, I was a consultant for MySQL, and when we roll this out for people there, uh, we would normally couple that in a MySQL setup with a. Uh, normal MySQL application to get the geographic, uh, the geographic redundancy part, and then maybe have like a DRBD pair in one place and a DRBD pair in the other place, and and then a, an asynchronous replication between them um, is what we'd do for that. And and how that would work is obviously going to be much more application or database uh, dependent as to how you would rig something like that. So this is a, um, no, it's a little small. Sorry about that. I say small, it's like 20 feet. But um, uh, anyway, so here's, here's sort of a, a, I completely stole this straight from the rbd.org website. Um, so the, the fine folks at Lenbit made, uh, made this graphic and I, I apologize, none of the rest of the graphics in the talk are anywhere near as nice as this. Um, uh, if you can't happen to, to read that from where you're at, it's on the rbd.org. Um, but anyway, so, so the thing with the rbd, essentially what it is, is it's a, it's a, it's, um, uh, it sits as a layer uh, right on top of your right on top of your block device layer. So it it, it presents a uh, it presents a block device interface uh, upon which you can you know do file system operations or, or things like that. Um, so essentially, it sits sits between your real block device and your uh, and your file system or whatever other thing might be interfacing with that block device. Uh, although for most of us, in most cases, it's uh, a file system. Um, so, uh, and, and it's, it, as you can sort of see from the, they've, they've lovingly uh, split this out into multiple things. It, it actually sits between the buffer cache and the disk scheduler. Um, but, uh, 
Uh, so it's going to do that, and what, what happens is it's going to take the write in. Um, as soon as that write comes down through the, the, um, the buffer cache and over to into the DRB block, it, it spits out um, to, the, to the network stack, sends it across the network. Um, actually, both, both disks at this point, that once it's sent it out, it's a, it's a, internally it, it's, not a, it's not a blocking call. So it, it sends out the network thing and it writes, does the write locally at the same time. But it won't, it, it's a, there's a two-phase, um, I don't even have a slide for that, but it's in a different thing. Oh well, crap. Anyway, so there's a, there's a two-phase uh, protocol that's going on so that it sends it across, starts the write here, but it doesn't do the local, uh, the local F-sync until, the, the, until it's gotten the ACK across from the other box at which point it can just do its, its, final, um, its final okay. Oh, crap. It do its final okay on the, uh, on the local box and then, and then return that everything is good. There's a configuration parameter that you can relax that. Um, so you can say in the configuration, um, hey, instead of, instead of returning on the primary box when the secondary box has returned that it's complete right, you can say, hey, return when it's hit the secondary box's uh, you know, buffer. Um, or, or something like that, or even its network stack. It turns out for some reason that I still don't think they've fixed because it's not really that um, uh, sought after when you're setting up a system like this, which is pretty much designed to be synchronous. Um, the two options that, that theoretically should go quicker, like the return once the secondary's got it in its, in its buffer cache, um, are slower, actually. <laughs> so not really sure why, but um, so, so pretty much the safest version is, is actually in the current implementation, the fastest version. So use it. Um, so I've, I have never in my life changed that configuration parameter. Um, and I don't recommend that you do either. Um, the nice part about, so that's the write cycle. The read cycle is always read from the local disk. So reads have no performance penalty on them because um, you're, just, you're just reading locally. Um, so it, so you're, you're really only, you're only taking the hit on, uh, on the writes. And then it's, it's typically, you know, you're talking about the latency of a, uh, of a network round trip is the thing. So a lot of times in actual usage when we're doing like, when we're putting like a, a database workload on it or something like that, we'll see something around, depending on the disks and the network and the everything, yada yada, but uh, we'll see somewhere around a 30% drop in, uh, in, in disk system throughput uh, as far as writes go. And then nothing really for reads. Um, so here we get to the, the, the lame pictures that, that I or other people have drawn that aren't Linbit. Um, so this is, this is sort of just the plain DRBD itself, and you'll see at the top it's got service listed, which is whatever you're running on top of it, be it a mail server or a database server or, or what have you. Um, so as an example, and this actually sort of uh, is, is mentioning what you're talking about with the, with the asynchronous, if we were going to run MySQL on top of this and you also wanted to do a MySQL replication, it actually works really nicely because um, the, the way that MySQL replication works in general is that it writes binary logs to disk, and if you make those binary logs to disk uh, reside on the same block device that you're synchronizing with DRBD anyway, then all of the replication infrastructure is being replicated to the, to the, to the passive master. And so when you do a failover, all of the slaves are just connecting to a virtual IP anyway, and they really have no idea that you've changed anything. So it's a, it's a pretty seamless failover for something like that. Um, uh, and 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 works works really well when you're doing like a, uh, so so a common practice in in this setup um, with MySQL is to do a um, an active passive DRBD pair and then hang a, a, a string of read only slaves off of it to get your read scalability and then further on down the line if you need to start sharding then you do sets of those things um, and it, and it works uh, so that your 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 management of post master failure is almost nothing. Uh, it just it just works magically and everything keeps keeps on chunking. Um, uh, so, which is what I was saying here. So, if if then you need to do application level partitioning, you can you can s split the data up into. And we're starting to talk about sharding, which really has nothing to do with the RBD other than to point out that if you're going to do a sharding setup with something like this, and it's the same thing. Again, this would work with with any database you're sitting on top of it. If you're starting to shard your data, then what you wind up doing a lot of times is doing a DRBD pair per shard. Um, so that you've got, uh, so that each, each of the things that, that owns a particular chunk of data has two machines thrown at it, so one of them can catch on fire and the other one is fine and, and everybody's happy and nobody gets pages at two o'clock in the morning, which is really, I gotta tell you, the, the, the big win for, for me. Uh, I hate getting paged at two in the morning. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, so uh, so, the, so if, we, if we look at, at this thing, one of the things that you get here in this setup is you can get read scalability, 
by adding on replication slaves, right? Um, but the DRBD gives you nothing with write scalability. In fact, it hampers your write scalability a little bit because of that. So, um, so what you do, actually, do I have a, I think I've got a, oh, I've got a picture. Hey, hey, there we go. Um, so so what, you, what you can do instead to get write scalability then is to take your application and split the data um, either either horizontally or, or vertically, so either, either by task or, or type of data, or inside of the data, pick you know some of the rows out of each table and stick stick them in. Your application at this point sort of has to know which data is on on which shard. We, the the sections of data are typically referred to as shards, um, and and so then your application is talking to at that point multiple database instances. But so instead of instead of just Thinking of it as so, so when you draw that out, you have like database A, database B, database C, you know, database server, like multiple database servers. So, but each one of those database servers then can be thought of as a logical grouping of potentially, you know, a DRBD master slave pair and then a whole bunch of read only slaves. So, yes? Um, yeah, this is actually that load balancer SQL relay thing probably uh, shouldn't shouldn't, that's, that's actually sort of crappy. Um, I should have fixed that, sorry. Um, when you're doing sharding to, yeah, you've pretty much at this point, there's a couple things that are sort of, there's a couple products that have been tried to, that have been written to try and do that, some of that automatically. But when you're, when, you're, when you're splitting your data across multiple different database servers, uh, most of the time these days you're, you're gonna be looking at uh, writing knowledge of how you've, how you've split your data into the application, um, yeah. Yeah, and so then load balancing in this case, where I might use an actual load balancer or LVS or something like that, would be potentially like across the read slaves, um, so that you've got like a, an IP for the for the read slaves, and you can just bounce bounce stuff between them for reads. But yes. So you have a slice that you on multiple, multiple no, no, not at all, not in MySQL. Maybe another database technology, but there is currently one slave. Uh, a slave may only have one master. A master may have multiple slaves. Um, we may be fixing that in Drizzle. Well, I'm sure we're going to fix that in Drizzle. We may be fixing that in Drizzle within the next year rather than the next 10 years. MySQL will also fix that at some point too, but I don't know much, as much about their internal roadmap as ours. Um, because, yeah, that could be useful for other things as well. Um, so, just in case anybody hasn't, so like I said before, this is a, it's a virtual block device layer. Um, which isn't a very meaningful statement if you don't know what block device is. Um, so uh, a, uh, block device is a, it's a, it's a, it's a type of device that we, we use too. Um, it's a special type, file type and we're using it in uh, Unix-like operating systems and in this case, this being Linux Conf AU, uh, Linux, because um, I don't really care about the other ones. Um, uh, although it would, oh, oh, you know, that brings us up. Uh, may have been on a slide back here. I may just not have said the words. Nope. Uh, so when this says, uh, so this is, is in fact correct. It is a block device is common to, to um, uh, Unix-like operating systems and possibly other ones. I just don't know anything about them. Um, DRBD, however, is, is not uh, on common Unix-like file systems. It works on Linux and only Linux. Um, so if you're using something else, you're screwed. Um, that's often the case for many other reasons as well, but you know, just thought I'd be upfront about that. Um, uh, so it, this is this is an abstraction. It's actually one of the things that you know made Unix so revolutionary back in the I got dates wrong earlier 60s, 70s, whenever it was was coming out um, of abstracting things like you know devices um, <laughs> into into nice file like things. So anyway, so block device is just the the way that we do that. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go through all of that. But um, so in DRBD, uh, each each block device that is that is a that is a is presented by DRBD uh, can either be primary, primary or secondary. Uh, primary corresponding to active and secondary corresponding to passive. Unfortunately, there's like seven different pairs of words that people use to refer to these sorts of things. Uh, but in this case, the DRBD terminology is primary and secondary. Um, the machine that has a, 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 a DRBD uh, device that is in a primary state may access that, uh, may access that, that device. Um, any, any attempts at accessing a, a, a DRBD device through the, through the DRBD um, layer on a, if, if that device is, is in the secondary state uh, returns a, a, an IO error. Um, basically just says, nope, sorry, can't do that. Um, actually, I think it actually returns as a, as a permissions problem, but you know, 
um, everything's a permissions problem, right? Um, so uh, so, you, you, so the, the stack that you, you put along with this uh, ensures that you are doing all of your application level accesses of this data through the primary node at all times, because you're SOL otherwise. Um, so then you send the writes to the, um, uh, to the block device, like I was talking about earlier, and it, it goes over the secondary, um, to the secondary node. Um, the reads are always local, uh, which is one of the nice things about this uh, compared to a SAN or a NAS. Um, there are other ways in which it's different, but you know, you're, you're talking about actually local disk um, in here rather than something else. Um, and I can go into long rants about SANs, but that's a, another talk. Um, and, uh, and so if the primary node fails, then you, in, this, in the simplest thing, you've got heartbeat and it's looking at, at node health and you kill the one node and, it, and heartbeat notices and it, take, it starts things up on the second node, uh, which has nothing to do really with surface level health, but that's another thing that can be discussed as well. Um, but so then the, essentially the, the steps are make the secondary node primary, then mount things on it, then start your stuff, um, which is uh, what I've got right here. So when the, when the failed node, when you're bringing up a failed node and making it, um, uh, so after the primary node has failed in our last example, uh, it fails and it comes back on because maybe somebody had just kicked the power cord out of it or something, you know, the cleaners decided that they wanted to rearrange the cords for you. Um, it, it, it turns on, it becomes a secondary node, it contacts the primary and says, hey, what did I miss? Um, and, the, uh, and then it, it syncs in the background. Um, one, of the, one of the nice parts is that it, uh, the primary node keeps a bitmap of changed blocks. So rather than, rather than transferring over the changes that have happened over that period of time, it just gives it essentially the current state of, of any blocks that have changed since they were last in contact. Um, so resynchronization after a failure event, unless, unless you've been unconnected for a very, very long time and you've actually changed all the blocks on your disk, uh, is, is actually typically a pretty, uh, a, pretty quick a pretty quick thing, depending on what you've changed. Um, because even, even tons and tons of write load from your, from your database is really probably only have going to change a certain number of the blocks in the, in the database file. So you're, you're pretty good uh, to go there. Um, uh, device size is currently lifted to four terabytes. I think they just lifted that. Like, I think they just fixed that. I haven't had anybody who, for whom that's been a problem yet. Um, but, you know, I'm pretty sure that's fixed now. Yes? Um, oh, sure. Yeah. If you're going to send over all of the data, like if, it, if it's an actual like 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 pristine restart, then it's going to it's going to be pretty pretty disk size dependent. But uh, but if the 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 um, the resynchronization isn't in in, in in resync cases isn't device size dependent as much as yeah okay cool no problem it, yeah it's sort of written unclearly sorry about that. Um, so some, uh, some, some requirements uh, here, and I actually just changed a couple of these because um, they were getting out of date. Um, uh, hosts, uh, minimum of two. Uh, I should really also say maximum of two if we're talking about just DRBD because DRBD supports two and only two hosts unless you do the new DRBD plus thing. But um, the use cases for that are, well, they're okay. Three, I can see three hosts, but then you're talking about two computers sitting there doing what looks like nothing and managers start to get iffy about that. Um, but two hosts. Um, hardware, normal hardware you, you, you like to get, I recommend multiple NICs. Uh, you really want a, a private NIC uh, set up. Hey, we fixed the, the display driver. This is my laptop, yeah. Yeah, well it wasn't me, I didn't do it. Um, memory, DRB really doesn't care. Uh, it doesn't really use a whole heck of a lot of memory itself. Of course, it's a computer, so you want as much memory in there as you can afford because, well, it's RAM. and You want more RAM because more RAM is better, always. Um, uh, storage, for, for database stuff in general, we, we recommend uh, zero plus one a lot. Um, however, a thing to point out here is that if, you're, if, uh, if, if you want to, um, you can do uh, just a RAID a RAID 0 on each host because you've already got the plus one part with the two hosts already, except that Trent probably doesn't like that. <laughs> I, 
Yes. Yeah, it's, it, it is, it is, it is, it is potentially fraught with peril. If anybody didn't, didn't hear, if everybody didn't hear Trent there, uh, his, his point was if you, if you got your raid, uh, uh, you raid zero in each box, uh, and, and, and having the one being taken care of by the DRBD, and you have a, a failure on, on one of the things, uh, on one of your boxes, like, you know, disk failure or whatever, you're essentially going to have to do a full, re a full resync of everything, um, which means that you're going to be transmitting all of that data across the network, which means everything is going to be slow as crap um, during that, that full resync, and you don't really want to do that. So um, you can do this. It is fraught with peril, but you can, just to point that out. Um, Network, uh, you technically could do 100 megabits, but oh my gosh, who is running anything under gigabit at this point? Please, go to the store, cards are like $10 gigabit, because even at that point, you know, it, it, at 100 megabit, you're limited to 12.5 megabytes a second of transfer rate, um, and your disks are faster than that. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. So I'm curious if you run into this, um, on one DVD setup I've got for something I'm doing, um, continually with the gigabit ethernet, I get these checksum errors where it decides that the data DVD sent and when it arrives is different. And it does it like every minute. Like if you leave the DVD connected every minute, one of these events happens and eventually has to stop and resync the DVD. And if I change network cards, it doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, have you run into that? Because I swear it's a bug because we had DVD running for a year and a half before they, we upgraded to the version of the checksuming and we never had a single problem with data corruption or anything like that. Yeah. And the D Limbit guys swore like, no, it's not a bug, you know, you must have broken network card or something, but it worked for a year and a half, what? Yeah. So that's actually, that's actually sort of fun, and actually that brings up something that I should add as a slide to this. Um, so uh, a, a thing in general to know is that network cards are getting worse and worse every year. Um, many of your network drivers are lying to you. Um, many of them say that they're offloading hardware checksumming, and they're not. And some of them are doing checksumming wrong. Woohoo! But not reporting it. Um, so we actually ran into this with uh, um, the checksumming feature that, that hit in DRBD 8.2, uh, 8.1, doesn't matter, uh, that hit in was actually because we'd, we'd rolled, MySQL Consulting had rolled out uh, a big DRBD setup for this client, and they kept having crashes and, and all sorts of problems and they needed resyncing all the time and, and it was it was typically pretty horrible. But it would like be random. Like it'd be going and then all of a sudden it'd fall out of sync. Like after some random amount of time. And we eventually tracked it down. I believe it was the T G three uh, uh T G three cards and, and drivers or whatever that Yep. Yeah it's crap. It's absolute garbage. You should throw it away. Um, anybody in here involved with the manufacturer that makes those cards? Yeah, everybody, if you have those, throw them away. They're garbage. Um, and and they, they absolutely lie, and they break, and, and, and they make your life uh, crap, um, but in ways that you may not notice. Oh, the, uh, yeah, the TG3, uh, the Broadcom. Yeah, the ones that use the TG3 driver. Um, so it's it's a it's a it's a thing that 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 we're like oh hey it's a bad nick we'll just get a new one <laughs> no it was pretty much all of them all of them that we've come across have all at at, at some point in their lifespan been a been a serious problem um, so they added the checksumming in at the at the application layer which you can turn on and off like you can turn it off because it's it there is an extra performance set there to do checksumming over the protocol um, but. Uh, there were instances, it's, it's much easier to turn on the DRB checksumming and have that tell you that you're having networking problems um, first before trying to track down some sort of, you know, ethereal problems that may or may not be happening at the moment. You're not sure what's going on. It, it looks like somebody just unplugged the cables, but they look like they're plugged in, and yeah, it's, it's pretty awful. So, um, oh, this is the slide where I said it's Linux only. So anyway, so all of that to say, uh, yeah, your network card's probably broken and um, nobody trusts those TG3 drivers. Um, it's, it's awful, 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 awful. Um, so most of the time um, when, I, when I do this, again, because network cards are cheap, even cards that aren't the TG3s are, are, are pretty cheap these days, um, to, if you need to replace them, uh, we're almost always stick in a couple of, you know, you know, when I'm setting this up, I'll stick in at least four NICs in a, in a machine and, and use the Linux level uh, NIC bonding uh, to get 
uh, essentially two pairs of bonded interfaces because what you want is you want a private channel that is essentially only used for DRBD um, because it's going to be at times transferring um, a lot of data over that channel. Um, and there's a really fun story to tell about that too. I'll get to that in a second. Um, I just realized that's a really fun war story. Um, took down an entire data center. I'll tell it right now. Um, so so we, we had, a, had a customer that was, in, we were selling DRBD for them and it was a hosted uh, facility. I think it was like, you know, Verizon or somebody like that. Uh, not to pick on Verizon, it wasn't their fault. Well, it was their fault, but yeah, they fixed it. Anyway, um, but we, we said in the requirements, we need, we, need a, we need a network segment that's actually like, what we'd really like is if you take two machines, stick them next to each other, and plug in a couple of direct cables between their, their NICs um, for, the, for this DRBD thing, that's, that's what we want, right? That's, that's the thing. And they're like, oh yeah, sure, no problem. And so they, you know, they, they did that. Um, or they, they told us that they did that. And so we, we plugged it in and, and we turned it on and it started the initial resync, um, at which point the entire uh, data center's network grid uh, died. Um, <laughs> because because we, had, we had the two bonded NICs and, and it turns out that they hadn't actually plugged them in with direct cables. They'd plugged both of them on both machines and into, their, into their networking mesh. But they had done it in such a way and, and we happened to pick the bonding uh, scheme in the, in the NIC thing um, such that the path was one way through one cable and one way through the other cable. So it was, it was the, the, the packet was coming through and the bonding thing was sending out a, a, a reverse ARP request uh, out, the, out the back, you know, in, in response, which was essentially broadcasting for every packet that came across, a UDP broadcast to say, hey, who, who did this come from? <laughs> and so all of a sudden we were, we were splatting 125 megabytes of a second but it was, it, was being, it was being propagated by their router system. So their router system was then broadcasting <laughs> megabytes and megabytes of, of data to everyone's NIC trying to find out where it had come from. And of course we were swapping. So anyway, um, long story short, uh, in some cases actually direct cables are better than plugging something into the mesh. Um, yes? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Totally agree. Uh, for anybody that didn't hear that, he said uh, direct cables uh, good, but don't necessarily stick the, the machines right next to each other because the likelihood of somebody pulling the cables out of both of them at the same time is is actually pretty pretty decently high. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's not good. There's, there's a bug there um, in the config. But uh, so you said he had a, a heartbeat set up that, that if you pulled out the network link, it would cause the other one to shut down. Um, and, and so you'd lost the power on one and the other one would say, hey, my network link went down. I'm going to shut myself off. <laughs> and, and so you lose both of them. So that's not good. Uh, so there's a couple of different there's a couple of different things. It's it's all it's all very highly configurable. At the, well, not highly configurable. It's, it's configurable at this point. Um, uh, essentially, the, the main thing is that you the the for the first step of of dealing with split brains is always prevention, um, obviously. Um, and and the the thing that it, that it does um, is when you when you pair this with the the heartbeat from the guys at Linux HA. Um, they've got a they've got a thing called the 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 DOPD the DRBD outdate peer daemon that runs and um, and talks over the so the DRBD talks just on that one on that one communication channel but when you set up heartbeat I, I normally convince people to set up the heartbeat so that it talks over every available bloody channel you've possibly got because as long as heartbeat's talking to heartbeat it's okay and so if the DRBD servers get out of touch with each other they'll send messages over, over the heartbeat communication channel to the other one to see, hey, heartbeat, can you see the other box? If you actually have you know, lost all three of your network channels and your serial port and everything like that else, you know, then it's possible you could have both of them up. In that case, though, nobody should be able to be talking to you from the outside anyway. It's OK. But if you do actually manage to trigger a split brain, um, there's, a, there's a set of hooks inside of the, inside of the DRBD configuration that uh, allow you to configure what actions it should take uh, in a post split brain condition. So it'll cover when the nodes come back into contact with each other, they're like, oh, hey, we've, we've experienced a split brain. Um, 
and, and it knows several things. It knows which one was most recently the master. It knows various things like that. And so you can tell it different strategies like discard younger, discard older, discard whatever. Or what we normally do is um, please don't do anything um, and just tell us and we'll figure it out. Because at that point, if you've, if you've done all of your setup work properly, the split brain condition should be so ridiculously rare that it is OK at that point if you get called in 3 in the morning. So. Um, so that to be said, uh, it may or may not be on a uh, thing. So what I just sort of glossed over there real quickly, and I think I realized that there's not a specific slide on this, uh, or there might be. Um, yeah, I, I'll figure it out. We'll come back to it if there's not. Um, so an important thing with this is I mentioned very early on, uh, DRBD is implemented as a, as a kernel module. It's currently not in the, in the, in the kernel tree. Um, it's been submitted and uh, there's there's a really nice fun uh, email uh, uh, thread that you can that you can read uh, with everybody picking apart the the code and telling them everything it has to do to, for it to actually get into the tree and you know responses of oh but I've been doing that for years and you know they're like we don't care you're changing it and you know all of that stuff it's great it's it's a really fun read um, but they're working on that and it's not in yet um, so it's one of it so one of the things when you're managing the system it being an external kernel module is that if you update your kernel and you forget to <laughs> install a new version of the of the uh, of the DRBD kernel module you're you're pretty much hosed um, cuz you you won't have your thing and you'll have to then do it so anyway rule number 1 uh, please don't forget to uh, update your DRBD modules and especially if you've got managed hosting of any sort um, which always causes me pain but if you do uh, make sure that when they decide to apply security updates to your kernel for you, um, that they know that they've got to rebuild the RBD as well. Um, there are uh, pre-built packages uh, for, for s specific kernel versions. There are packages already in like the Ubuntu repositories and stuff like that. Uh, there's also, um, uh, you know, top of tree type packages like latest supported that you can, you can get uh, with support contracts from both Linbit directly and also through uh, MySQL resells those. Um, if you're into that sort of thing. Um, uh, honestly, I'm not a salesperson, and I would say that uh, if you can type configure make make install, um, it's pretty easy to build DRBD um, as long as you've got a working set of kernel headers. Um, so I, I normally, and actually there's a, uh, the make files have like a make RPM, uh, and I think even a, no, they don't have a make deb, but there's a, the, the deb stuff is pretty kept, kept pretty up to date. So I, I haven't needed to, anyway. Long story short, um, it's not that bad. So upgraded uh, if you upgrade the kernel. Uh, the current version is 8.27, uh, according to the, to the website. They list an 8.3, but the changelog for 8.3 uh, lists the top version as 8.27. So uh, I think 8.27 is really the, the latest version. Um, you can run, uh, you can run uh, DRBD. This is a, a, a recent thing in the last couple of years. But you can run uh, DRBD on top of LVM. And actually, what we have people do for uh, database uh, backups a lot of times is do an LVM snap on the on the secondary host. Um, so because you're doing synchronous writes anyway, break the DRBD, do a snap real quick, um, just to be sure. Bring the link back up; it'll resync. You've got the snap. Copy the snap off, and you're you're good to go. Um, so so then you've got multiple layers of virtual <laughs> virtual block devices. You have real block device, you have LVM, and you have DRBD on top of that. Um, you could also then, if you wanted to get really crazy, uh, build a, a, an LV on top of the DRBD device um, if you wanted to then split that up into multiple things, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you're sort of probably a little bit uh, masochistic, but you know, whatever. Yes? Uh, I haven't seen anything that's been particularly measurable on top of the right performance hit for having the extra network hop in there um, on, the, on the LVM stuff. But I haven't done a specific benchmark of that. Yes? Uh, it seems to me like you could, I would say, essentially build it as one device domain. Mm -hmm. You arrange one device in, in the remote state and then the one to write. Mm -hmm. well, that seems like you could do that instead of the RBD. What, what you could. So one of the nice things about, about this is the, is the automatic fencing that occurs. When you're doing uh, automatic fencing, um, so DRB does not allow you to mount the device on the second machine, A, if it's mounted on the first machine, and B, if, it's, if, it's, uh, if, it, if it happens to know that it's out of sync. It's still possible to get a split brain, but one of the things that's not possible is for you to accidentally mount the same physical device on two machines and write to it. 
um, which is the thing that, that when you're doing this with, with actual shared storage, um, which you can do, and, and in some cases, you know, it may be the thing that you need to do for performance reasons. But when you're doing that, you have to be extremely careful. Um, typically setting up Stoneth, uh, shoot the other node in the head uh, devices to ensure that under no circumstances anybody mounts the disk on two different machines and then starts writing to it, because then you're just in a world of, of everything is dead, um, which, is, which is bad. Um, so it pretty much saves you the effort and, and the complexity, because that's one of those things that like, you can think that you've gotten it right, but you don't know that you've gotten it right till the time that you got it wrong. <laughs> and, and, then, and then you're in a world of hurt. Um, so that's, that's one of the things that I really like about it, is the, the ease, of, ease of management as far as that goes. Um, uh, so from a setup and configuration uh, perspective, uh, it, it's pretty straightforward. You install the packages or you build it from source, either one. Um, there's a single configuration file at cdrbd.conf. Um, and it's, if, you, if you get the source archive or, 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 the, or probably even the packages, the, there's an example, drbd.conf, that has every single possible configuration option and copious comments. It's possibly one of the best commented example configuration files I've ever read and sort of funny too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so you set up the configuration file. Uh, step number, uh, step number three here: choose primary node. When you're first setting this up, you have two disks. Uh, they're even if they're both empty, you still got to pick the one because DRBD is going to do a sync. If it's if it's a disk full of zero, it's it's going to copy over every last zero. Um, <laughs> it's the fun thing of the initial the initial sync because it's a block device layer. It doesn't care what data you stick. If, if you write, if you cat dev random into your, into your DR, dev DRBD's zero device, it will happily synchronously replicate all of those random uh, data that don't mean anything to the other machine. It's, it's a block device that doesn't care what you write there. So you can write any file system, you can write whatever. Um, so you gotta pick one and then you synchronize, you do the first sync, at which point in time it should remain in sync from that point on. Um, so if you were doing this on a fresh disk, you then, uh, uh, you then create a, a file system, not in the underlying, so if you had like a, you know, dev SDA one, which was the, the uh, block device you were doing this on top of, you know, you're gonna make a dev DRBD zero, which is essentially like the layer on top of it, and you create the file system on that, not on the, not on the underlying um, thing. Your underlying block, of, so that brings up a point. Um, the, the question about being able to access the, uh, the block devices on the secondary machine, um, at no point does DRBD ever prevent you from accessing the underlying block device that DRBD is, is, is uh, configured on top of. So there's a dev SDA1 there. If you decide to go and mount dev SDA1, you can do that. You're gonna break data, but you know, you can, you can do that all you want to. Um, it's not gonna stop you, so just don't do that. Um, pretty much you should just, once you've set this up, you should just never, ever, ever have anything touch whatever the underlying thing all of these things should be removed from mention in FS tab and stuff like that. So. Uh, not on the secondary machine, because it's not. Yeah, it's just injecting, it's injecting calls into the, into the thing, so it's, it's. Yeah, you can, yeah, it might. I, I, I just don't touch them, is my, my typical thing. Uh, the, which is the reason, because there was a, a period of time there where, where uh, someone was suggesting what you could do is stop the DRBD replication on the, um, on the secondary machine and then mount the underlying block device to, 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 take, a, to take a backup out of it, except that you know, mounting isn't always, you know, doesn't always not touch the underlying block device. Um, so that's just, uh, I just think that's a bad idea, which is why we stick to the, the LVM underneath it and take a, take a snap from the, um, from the underlying thing, which is, which is a little bit safer. Um, so anyway, so then once you've got that set up, actually uh, you, can, you can manage the, the primary secondary nature of DRBD and the mounting and unmounting of it and everything by hand, but that would be really sort of annoying um, and would, would uh, kill almost all of the benefits of having an automatable uh, high, high availability system. Um, so, uh, so that's what we install Heartbeat to do, which will um, 
make the DRBD volumes primary, secondary, mount and unmount volumes, start and stop services, be it Drizzle or Postgres or Exum or, you know, whatever it is that you're running on top of the file system. Uh, and then also manage a virtual IP because you typically want a, a virtual IP to be managed between the, the two boxes. Um, Heartbeat's a pretty simple, I say Heartbeat's a pretty simple thing to do. It takes me about five minutes to set up Heartbeat. Um, the first time you set up Heartbeat, you're probably going to be reading a lot of comments and configuration files, but um, I, I promise it's not as hard as you might make it to, uh, as you might want to make it um, the first time you do it. Um, but there's essentially three, three configuration files. There's one that's listed here that I need to delete. Um, there's, a, there's a configuration file which just does all the general resources like, hey, send Heartbeats over, you know, over ETH1 and ETH0 and, you know, TTYS0 and stuff like that. Uh, there's a HA resources file. All of these are, are located in uh, at CHA.D by default. Um, HA resources lists, uh, lists because Heartbeat is in the business of managing resources on machines. So Heartbeat decides that a machine should be the machine that owns resources and it will start or stop those, those resources, which essentially just run uh, essentially out of like an it script, an it style script. Um, I should mention this point. Anybody here from the Linux HA project? The, anybody here that, that's from the Linux HA project that does, that writes Heartbeat? All right, so but he's not in this room. All right, um, there's a version two of Heartbeat, which is what I always install. Um, there are two versions of the configuration system, the, the old style version one configuration system and the new style version two configuration system. Um, I would be disagreed with by the guys writing it because they're the guys writing it and it's their software and they're, that's free. In, in my experience, the version two version of the way that you configure things is um, almost every client I've been to who has attempted to set that up has broken things horribly and miserably um, because it's, it's designed to, to manage N node clusters. Um, and so it's a much more flexible and much more, uh, much more involved system. Um, which means there's this, this is the, the old style configuration is designed to manage two nodes. And since your underlying system here is DRBD, you have two nodes. So it's pretty much optimized for the simple case that you're doing. Trent. Yeah, the new system's all XML. You write an XML file, you load it into the new system, and from that point you can no longer edit the XML file. You have to use commands to send maybe snippet updates of XML file configuration update snippets. Um, and stuff like that, so that the system updates its own. I mean, if, if it all worked, it'd be, it'd be fantastic and, and much more flexible, but the problem is is that it's much more complicated for the simple case of you've got two machines. So in the simple case, you've got one line in one file that lists an IP address and a bunch of, of resources to manage on, on, that, on that node. And in the other one, you've got a really big, long uh, XML file with dependencies and, and weightings. Um, so anyway, I recommend highly using the old style unless you have specific needs that can't be described by the old style that need to, to manage the new style. Yes? So, I mean, uh, you mean that version two is got, got an, uh, an option to use the old configuration Yes, style? yes. Um, essentially, you don't put in your configuration file uh, use CRM, which is the new, CRM is the cluster resource management system. Um, and, and you just don't turn that on, and you just give it old style files, and, it, and it, it's, gobs easier to deal with for the simple case. Um, one of the things that a simple case in this case doesn't do, the old style system doesn't do resource monitoring at all. Um, so if you would like for something to say, um, fail over to the other box if MySQL crashes, you know, and it's gone away and all of a sudden you have no database resource anymore and you would like for something to be monitoring that and do the failover, uh, the, the heartbeat old style config does not handle that case. One of the things that the new style was designed to handle is to be able to hook in monitoring scripts and take action based on the results of the monitoring scripts. Um, yes? Yes, if you're, into, if you're into GUI sorts of things and you don't mind clicking buttons on stuff, there, is, there, is, there, are, there are GUI things that help you to write and manage the new style configuration system. I myself like things that I can edit with VI, um, <laughs> which is probably one of my biggest beefs with the new style system. Um, but also th there are some things that are, that, that where it really is designed to, um, because it's designed to handle, since it's designed to handle in systems, it, it, the part of the failover system is, is 
uh, is in such a way that you're talking about, um, well, if th this condition should be weighted more strongly than this condition, and in the, in the presence of these two conditions, then this action should happen. And the thing that I want is, it's up, bring these things up. It's down, turn them off. <laughs> so, um, so, yes. Uh, not being able to manage the resources. Yeah, so what I, what I typically do, uh, the way that we typically handle this, there's another program called Mon, uh, and you can do this, with, there's, there's several different ones. Some people use Monit, some people use Mon, some people use uh, custom written things. But what, what I typically have it do is, I have, I have Heartbeat start a Mon daemon on the, on the server that, that, it's, that it started resources on, and the Mon daemon is configured to check the resources that I've started. And then if the Mon daemon uh, decides and it's got you know you know uh, repeatable failure counts and stuff like that. So if it fails three times, then then do a trigger a failover. And then in the failover trigger step, I essentially have it say, hey heartbeat um, on this node, shut this node down. So so heartbeat starts mon, and then mon if it finds a failure, stops the heart. It doesn't stop heartbeat. It sends heartbeat a standby signal, um, which then will will trigger a failover to the other machine, which will start up the services and mon to monitor those services. Um, so I, I found that to be pretty, uh, pretty, pretty effective. Um, uh, so is that? Oh yeah. So um, so anyway, so we've we've started. We start the RBD. We start heartbeat. Um, uh, stuff happens. The, the next steps. Uh, uh, the part that I'm just going to wave my hands about is that if you do this, uh, the next steps are testing. You should test this. You should you should rip out every every conceivable thing that you can get your hands on to rip out. Uh, make all those hard failures go, pull a power cable, pull network cables, because there's combinations of things that you could pull um, that you're designing the system to avoid having happen. Like if you set up three, you know, if you set up dual NICs in the front and a, and a, and a you know, a, a channel for the DRBD and you're sending heartbeats over all of them, and you've also put in a serial cable and you're sending heartbeats over the serial cable, um, uh, and, and you go and you're testing and you, you disconnect all of those cables. Um, then it's, it's, you're going to create a split brain, which is useful in two things. One, it shows you um, you shouldn't ever pull all of those cables at the same time. Um, and, and other, it will give you the practice of recovering from a split brain. Um, but in, in, in actual practice, actually, you just want to never have that happen. Because um, in any HA system, no matter what it is, if you, if you remove all of the communications channels that the, that the HA system has to communicate with itself, you're just screwed. <laughs> so, um, yes? Oh, crap. All right. Uh, I think I'm, uh, so let me just, so, so your machine dies, um, the one machine becomes passive, it goes away, it resyncs, blah, blah. Active server is always up while you're resyncing to the, to the formerly passive thing. Um, uh, and, and then we're, we're, we're there. So we're, we're good. Uh, what questions can I answer? Sorry, that was sort of rambling. Yes, uh, yes. Is Yeah. Uh, I would imagine that it was go it, that it will get better. I would, I have n absolutely no data to get that. That's just sort of probably my optimism of, about uh, about things. I have not done a performance comparison between six and eight. Uh, I know that a, that a lot of there's there's a few new features like the the DRBD outdate peer daemon and stuff that have been added in. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the thing that that replaced. There was a. Uh, outdate.sh or something like that that they shipped or something like that in the older versions. But anyway, there's been a couple of new features that have been added that are, that are really nice for managing your, your, your stuffs. Yeah. In the old stuff, yeah. Yeah, that's, all, that's always the thing. <laughs> Trent, did you have a? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I gotta say that's actually a, re a really good point, and I, I sort of glossed over this because you know there's 
we could talk about specific configurations for a while, but definitely at, at the very minimum, there should be, there should be each node should have a, a, a connection to the public network that you're using to talk to this system that you're building. Um, there should be that, that private interface that, that the RBD is, is, is channeling over. Heartbeat should be configured to send heartbeats over both of those networks. So it should send over the public network and the private network. And you should go and buy a $10 null modem cable and plug it between the serial ports if there are serial ports on the boxes. If there aren't, go buy a null modem cable and two USB to serial converter dongles and plug those into your USB ports. Because like Trent said, if an overzealous sysadmin that wasn't quite n entirely aware of the thing comes in and says, ooh, I'm just gonna turn on this firewall and block all the ports. Um, and doesn't realize what he's doing, and we've had that happen to people, um, then if you've got the serial cable too, even though almost in all cases you'll never actually use the serial cable, in that case, it will prevent you at least from having a split brain, even though other things will be unhappy and you'll get emails and you know, things will be breaking, but you won't be split brain, split brain broken, which is a good thing. Um, and it's $10 or whatever, I mean, it's a null modem cable, um, I think. They might be getting expensive since they're getting rare. Nobody uses them anymore. They're not fashionable. Um, anyway, anything else? Yes. Uh, it's it's bad. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's it's since it's synchronous, it's um, the 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 slower WAN link thing. It's your 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 writes on the first server are, are going to be dependent on that. So you're you're introducing the latency of your WAN link into your ability to write to the to the primary host's disk. Um, so it's. What's that? Yeah, it's really bad on transactional database. Yeah, it, it'll really kill your, your performance and also the, the, the up and down nature potentially of the, of the link um, could also just make things sort of fluttery and weird and stuff like that. So yeah, it's, it is not recommended um, and stuff. Yes? Uh, we're going to do some, some like, on, uh, on what? On okay, oh. Yeah. Yeah, I imagine that you would. <laughs> yes, so um, it, you, you, you also find out, so I, I'm, I'm a big fan of doing some stuff with, with VMware and also with VirtualBox and, and things like that, um, but you, you discover really quickly when you throw a, a, a DRBD slash heartbeat setup in, into one of those things that, um, that you are still talking about virtual uh, devices, and when you put virtual device layers on top of virtual device layers, um, you, you find some interesting interactions. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, you, you want to you want to definitely uh, check out uh, timeouts and things of that nature um, in in that in that instance. Um, it, it can be fun, <laughs> and by fun I mean a big pile of crap. <laughs> Anything else? Great. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you.